Okay, planes, trains, and automobiles. So now we move on to trains and trucks and ships, that is freight. So the next panel is repowering freight. And one thing I want to say, maybe in the interest of, of saving time, we have our programs. They all have detailed biographies of the various speakers. And I'll refer you to those and suggest that we'll, we'll actually try to spend a little bit less time on introductions. I'll try to set a good example now as I introduce our moderator for the next panel, Galen Hahn. Uh, Galen was actually my client uh, when I was uh, leading the consulting team at Rocky Mountain Institute, we came out about 10 years ago to work with the ports of Seattle and Tacoma, and it was kind of a new thing that they actually worked together a little bit at that time. I didn't realize that was actually unusual. Um, and um, Galen was with the Port of Tacoma. He went on to work with the International, Mer um, the International Council on Clean Transportation uh, and has been in consulting and then joined Rocky Mountain Institute through its merger with the Carbon War Room just recently and is now back out uh, consulting. And I'll turn it over to Galen to uh, chair and moderate the panel on repowering freight. Thank you, Joel. A great model of efficiency for us uh, as we're getting into that subject. I'll invite the panel up and uh, I'll, so you guys take the uh, floor here, I'll launch into some introductory comments. Um, yes, yeah, so from planes to trains, uh, but unfortunately with no trains, we're covering a number of topics that could and in fact have been multi-day uh, conferences in and of themselves, so we're just going to give you little pieces and a little bit of an overview of an extraordinarily interesting and complex subject. Um, to kick off, does anybody have an idea of how much value of goods is moved around the world in freight? An order of magnitude? Anybody? All the, uh, this is, uh, Eileen talked earlier about 3%. That's about a gigaton of uh, greenhouse gas emissions coming from these ships. How many, how much goods? What's the value of that? Two dollars, five hundred trillion dollars. What's that? That's close. Anybody else? The ones of that, ones of trillions. Ones of trillions. Okay, let's kind of do the price is right thing. So, um, ten trillion dollars is about that. So, if uh, put that in perspective, the GDP of China is uh, last year was about eleven trillion. GDP of U.S. is about eighteen trillion. So, an incredibly important. Uh, part of the world economy and an incredibly important part of Washington's economy. So I'm going to frame this a little bit. Um, Jill, do you have that presentation I gave you? Um, So we'll talk a little bit about Washington and freight just to frame this issue and then get into some great Washington companies that are representing what we want to learn about freight and where we want to go with freight efficiency and new power repowering freight. So Washington has been called the most trade dependent state in the country. Of that $10 trillion, there's about $65 billion moving out of Washington state and about $47 billion of freight moving in. Um, this is goods like corn, manufactured goods, um, things that uh, move beyond our shipping ports bound for other regions, uh, agricultural manufactured goods that are made in Washington and in demand throughout the rest of the world. Um, I've had Washington apples in the Netherlands, had Washington wine in Singapore, and if you look at the labels of any of the stuff that you have in this room here, um, you're going to find that it was made somewhere else. And it got here through an incredibly sophisticated network of ships, trains, ports, and people. The widget that you got at the store the other day probably involved the decisions of hundreds of people in a supply chain to, to get it here. It probably traveled 6,500 miles, going through five different modes of transportation. So when you look at Washington, you're connected to the west best of the world. And, uh, Commissioner Feldman mentioned earlier about the Port of Seattle. We used to say thing about the Port of Tacoma. It's the gateway to Chicago. So a lot of stuff comes through Washington and moves directly inland. So the freight, the trucks, the rail, the ships, they're facilitating both Washington's economy and 
the economy of the country and the world. So the reason we're here, though, talking about freight is uh, because of diesel. Um, the previous panel mentioned uh, the value of diesel and the, just what kind of fuel density it has. It's for the maritime industry and the freight industry in general, it's built around diesel. It's incredibly cheap, relatively abundant, relatively safe, and for its energy, you, there's really no other alternative. But at the same time, we know that climate change is coming. We know the low carbon economy is coming more interest, uh, importantly. We see the signs in science, but we haven't seen the effects, uh, the real effects just yet. Uh, to mitigate these effects and maintain the economic benefits of, and quality of life that trade provides, we have to move beyond diesel and perhaps ultimately beyond uh, hydrocarbon fuels entirely. Um, given the complexity of the freight industries, there's no simple solutions. But breaking that down, there are three fundamental components to a solution. The first is simply making freight move with less power. Uh, increasing the efficiency of the systems and the individual parts creates cost and energy savings that persist and will persist regardless of the fuel type. So trucks that are hybrid drive, electric drive, regardless of what fuel you put in them, having them move with less power is going to be important no matter what comes next. And it's something uh, in all modes we can do right now. So thanks to the vision of companies like PACCAR, we're seeing uh, even greater efficiency gains in some of our most efficient freight transportation modes. Um, perhaps even more uh, significant uh, or at least equally as significant, uh, just in the last year, we're starting to see that we have incredible data resources coming out. For the first time ever, we're able to track freight from point A to point B, so we can start looking at a whole new metric. Rather than the efficiency of ships or trucks or trains, we can look at the efficiency of freight. So what happens when you can look at freight from point A to point B through those five, six modes that I was talking about earlier and say, well, we want to drive down the efficiency, the uh, unit energy per um, ton mile. And a company uh, startup called Globidum is doing that, providing that services to 3PLs like Expediter. And uh, with the Carbon War Room, just came out with a tool that is allowing you to look at ship efficiency in real time. So data is going to be incredibly important to freight. The next part of the solution, though, is finding ways to introduce alternative energy in a way that actually allows companies to maintain competitiveness and continue to deliver premium services throughout the freight network. Most nascent technologies and energy sources are not available at scale and price yet, as we, we talked about earlier with uh, cellulosic biofuels uh, and a lot of the sort of biofuels that could repower freight in aviation and other sectors. But some technologies like Flettner rotors, battery and hybrid systems, and LNG are available now. And companies like Tote on the panel here are showing their willingness to innovate and experiment with these technology, a rare hallmark of um, companies that in other sectors would be called early adopters. As with other industries, we know that looking at the future rather than fighting to reinforce the past is a better strategy in markets. There's the Netflix blockbuster example. The third part of the solution uh, to freight is going to ultimately be to, to decarbonize our energy sources. With cars, the first difficult part of decarbonizing personal transportation is just getting these cars out on the road. Next hardest part is making the electrons that go into those cars come from zero emission sources. So ocean going ships are never going to be battery powered just like uh, airplanes are never going to be battery powered. So fuels with high energy density like LNG will need uh, ultimately a renewable source to go from lower carbon to net zero carbon. Uh, forward thinking regulation has allowed tenacious entrepreneurs like Promis Energy to begin showing the pathway from lower impact to true sustainability. So with that, uh, I want to introduce an extraordinary panel. Um, they say that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And uh, with this panel and with everybody else I've heard today, I'm certainly in the right room um, with a tremendous amount of uh, intellect. Um, and so we're going to tell you more about the future of freight and how we're going to get there, starting with, let me get my 
my introduction notes here. Um, Dr. Carl Hergart. Uh, I'll give you a very quick intro. Uh, he's a PhD from Aachen University in Germany. He modeled uh, diesel engines in cylinders, very difficult. He also spent time at Ford, GM, Caterpillar, and he is now overseeing the advanced powertrain development for PACAR in North America. And uh, for the local flavor, he is a resident of Bellingham. So you'll see him in the store. He can run up to and ask a question about trucks. Carl? Thanks. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Galen. See, I've uh, got a few slides here to share, but uh, it's a pleasure being here. Appreciate the opportunity to um, be here today and talk to you about uh, freight and energy. And uh, so, now many of you might not know about PACAR, um, but I'm sure you've seen many of our products out on the roads. Uh, in fact, last year we sold 145,000 uh, trucks um, uh, worldwide, um, and uh, we're the second largest uh, truck manufacturer uh, for heavy-duty trucks in uh, North America under the Kenworth, Peterbilt, and Doff nameplates. Um, we've got about uh, we've been around for about 110 years, and we've got 78 years of straight profit. So Packard is uh, comprised of five primary businesses commercial vehicles, powertrain, aftermarket support, financial services, and uh, uh, information technology. And they're each contributing to uh, pack our success. Now, we're t here to talk about energy and, and uh, um, uh, repowering freight. And uh, fuel efficiency is, is always on the forefront of, of when we develop our products. And it's important to the end customer, the, uh, uh, owner of the truck fleet, the operator, um, but also in a wider socioeconomic perspective, as we've heard earlier today from uh, Eileen. Uh, given, given how much um, uh, oil the transportation industry is actually consuming and trucks uh, among it, and trucks uh, contribute a disproportional amount of, uh, we've had, got about 5% of um, the vehicle population, and as we heard today, 23% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, but also a, a thriving trucking industry is, is a, a key to economic growth, not only here in the U.S., but worldwide. Um, we heard also today uh, that 70 percent of the freight is, is, transport, is transported by trucks. Um, now, as, as we can see here, this is a study on the left here uh, by the, uh, conducted by the National uh, North America um, uh, Council for Freight uh, Efficiency, um, and uh, you can see that trucks have become a lot more efficient than they were. Um, this study was conducted over just uh, roughly 10 years, and you can see a 14% improvement in fuel economy among those fleets, and this is not just Packard, this is industry-wide, that adopted fuel-efficient uh, technologies. Um, it's worth pointing out that it, through that period of time, we've also had to contend with uh, um, a lot of emissions regulation, which, uh, you know, for, for good reason, um, but uh, we've been able to reduce the nitrogen oxides that contribute to smog, um, uh, as well as particulate matter uh, that goes into the atmosphere uh, by orders of magnitude. And, and this, uh, for those of you that have studied uh, engines, you know that there's a, tr a trade-off between fuel efficiency and, uh, and uh, nitrogen oxides, and we've been able to effectively reduce uh, nitrogen oxides while still improving fuel economy. So that's worth pointing out. Uh, there's there's a there's a lot of focus here, and over what we these are just some examples of what we would focus on. Uh, clearly, a lot of development on the engine. Uh, some might say we've we've worked on diesel engines now for over 100 years. Aren't we done yet? Well, there's there's still a lot of uh, sophistication that goes into uh, the design, manufacture, and support of these engines. Um, and as I said, uh, uh, they become more, uh, cleaner and cleaner, uh, and more diagnosable than ever. Uh, but clearly, there's a lot of effort going into that. We uh, have made 130,000 engines uh, since we introduced our own 13-liter uh, engine in uh, 2010. Um, but as, as we continue to improve the individual components of the powertrain, uh, like engines, transmissions, axles, drivelines, 
uh, it's not just about uh, optimizing the individual components, but the entire system, uh, such that the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, Aero is also a key uh, contributor to efficiency. About 25% or so of the losses um, are in the Aero, and we spend uh, a tremendous amount of energy on, uh, or effort on improving Aero using simulation tools as well as wind tunnel experiments. And uh, recently, in recent years, we've developed several features known collectively as advanced predictive features that you see on the lower left there. Uh, and here, in this case, we use uh, GPS-based terrain information to make intelligent decisions about uh, how we should, uh, what cruise we should speed, uh, speed we should cruise at, uh, as well as when we can coast the truck. So effectively managing the kinetic energy of the truck. Uh, but looking into the future, I mean, we, we've got um, a lot of um, uh, developments coming at, uh, coming at us here. Uh, Eileen outlined the uh, 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 greenhouse gas regulation. In 2021, uh, we're facing in a greenhouse gas phase two for trucks, uh, and that will be fully phased in by 2027, at which point uh, some of the configurations, like high roof sleepers, will have seen a 27% reduction in greenhouse gas industry-wide. Um, and, and that's where we're gearing up, up towards that. In addition to that, there is talk of an ultra-low NOx standard in California, and other states might follow. That is also something we have to be prepared for, uh, and we want to achieve those levels without sacrificing fuel economy. Um, and the other thing I would, I would uh, emphasize here is also that uh, several cities in Europe, and, and uh, there's discussions here in North America as well, about zero emission zones. So we have to be prepared to provide services or provide product uh, that enables to operate in uh, zero emission zones. So as such, uh, one has to consider hybridization and electrification. And we look at this um, uh, for a variety of applications. Uh, we're, um, so all of these examples that I'm giving here are projects that we're actively working. We're working on uh, 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 drainage solutions for port applications. We're working, for plug -in, uh, working on plug-in hybrid uh, solutions for pickup and delivery applications, and, and regional haul um, parallel hybrids uh, with uh, uh, last mile electric only delivery. Um, and, and that's certainly a, a significant development as well. And we're working on electrification for long haul. And as we do this, we, we have to look at or one challenge we're facing is to come up with a, uh, a modular and scalable approach that we can apply to all these solutions. So looking into the future, um, we've uh, heard some about uh, services today and the importance of c connectivity. Um, I'd say, um, and cars and trucks being becoming more and more automated. Um, you, you know, just, just think about the ABS system, anti-lock brake systems, and uh, automatic transmissions. We're, and in a lot of cases, we're no longer making those decisions. We are, we're not deciding when to shift or when, how to brake. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the car or truck is doing that for us. And so that's a form of automation, and that is set to continue. Um, th these, and a lot of it has to do with safety. Um, and today, trucks are, and vehicles are more connected th than ever. Uh, they're connected to uh, sensors, GPS information, uh, maps, and the ever-present cloud. And uh, uh, this, this will give the driver, operator, the opportunity to become more productive than ever. And with that, I'd like to show just a quick video here, which I hope works. This was all filmed here in the area, by the way. We're at the uh, tech center in Mount Vernon. So I think the interesting thing here is that we, um, we have a case where a traditional in industry like trucking is, is uh, um, merging with new technology. In this case, we're collaborating with NVIDIA, who you might know from game processors, and uh, not, not a traditional player in the automotive industry, exactly, certainly not in the trucks. But we've worked together here to develop a <coughs> SAE Level 4 self-driving truck that uh, we've demonstrated uh, around our, our track in Mount Vernon. Um, 
Yeah, so I think that's a pretty, a pretty exciting development that uh, we're looking forward to continue. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, it's uh, incredibly exciting that all this is happening just right down the road, too. It's a great Northwest company, Packard. Um, uh, next, we'll move on to Ben Christian uh, from Tope Maritime. Ben is the uh, vice president of um, marine services for Tote. Uh, right now, he, he oversees labor relations, marine supply chain services, uh, business development, and operations in the Puerto Rico trade. Uh, but more importantly for this group, he, uh, the Puerto Rico trade is served by brand new LNG powered ships that Ben uh, oversaw the development of just before moving out to where he is in now in Jacksonville. Uh, he managed the build, uh, both the new building LNG ships and the retrofits of the Orca class that operate out of Tacoma. Uh, ben was a graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, which uh, for our little industry, it's like the Ivy Leagues of school, so very uh, important tenure there, but also important for Washington and connections. He has a business degree from the University of Washington. Thank you. So uh, my focus and perspective today is from the end user on the freight side. So we're not developing the technology ourselves. We're not going out and producing the fuel. We're the end user. We're putting it onto our ships. And we're, we're hauling cargo for our customers. And uh, that's the perspective we're going to bring to this uh, discussion. This is uh, the East La Bea. This is the world's first natural gas powered container ship. It was built right here in the US. Uh, it was used, used as technology from all around the world. And it serves the people of Puerto Rico, hauling everything from diapers to cars, uh, back and forth, and there we have two of them in service, uh, running reliably and on time, and it's uh, been a huge success. So we'll get into some of the details and uh, what else is involved in our program. So these are just some pictures from the port uh, and also from the, uh, gr the green tanks are the LNG tanks. These are uh, cryogenic tanks, so the natural gas is liquefied uh, and extremely cold and then kept uh, without any refrigeration on board uh, for the length of the voyage. Uh, part of the tank is burned up as we go and then we refill it every trip. Uh, so Tote is a domestic transportation company. And what we do is we haul freight from Tacoma to Anchorage, Alaska and from Jacksonville to San Juan, Puerto Rico. So we're in what's known as the Jones Act. It requires uh, ships to be US built, US operated, US owned and US crewed. So Toad is part of the Salt Shuck family of companies. Uh, just to highlight a few that have a specific Northwest connection, Foss Maritime, there's a Foss Tug in Bellingham Harbor right now as I was driving up. Uh, Interstate, you'll see their green trucks on the road. They uh, also have some uh, LNG uh, powered trucks. Uh, and then Carlisle, which does ice road trucking and logistics to Alaska, heavy haul specialty freight and, and that type of thing. And uh, Saltchuk is headquartered right in Seattle. It's a, uh, either the largest or second largest privately owned uh, business in the state of Washington and is uh, women owned. So what got uh, the marine sector really focused on alternative fuels was sulfur. Sulfur in fuel in diesel is a huge issue uh, and is the, the impetus for the move to LNG in, in the biggest way. There's two lines here. There's the blue line, which is the emission control area. These are areas of the world that have chosen to have a higher standard, just like California has a different standard than the rest of the country on a lot of air issues. Uh, certain areas, including the coast of the US and Canada, decided to adopt emission control area and have a hi higher standard. Now that's being caught up to where the global standard uh, coming up in, in 2020 is going to drop. And business as usual cannot go on uh, in the marine uh, transportation sector as far as fuels. So what could we do? We saw it as we had three options. We could do nothing. We just buy more expensive diesel that's cleaner, has less crap in it. Uh, we could install exhaust gas cleaning systems, scrubbers. So we could scrub the fuel after it comes out of a diesel engine 
and try and clean it up the best we could and then deal with the effluent or the byproducts, uh, depending on which type of system we had, and see how long that would last until the regulations got tightened up even further, and then you have to come up with a new solution. Or option number three, which is what we went with, uh, was moving to LNG. And this had the best environmental impact. It was also the most difficult road. So most owners have not chosen this path as of right now. So uh, we replaced uh, our Ponce class uh, ships that in the Puerto Rico trade with the Marlin class. The Ponce class were smaller, they were powered by a steam turbine, and they used diesel fuel. We went to a direct drive, so one up and down of a piston is one turn of the propeller. Very efficient, no intermediate stages. Uh, we went with larger ships, so we have an efficiency gain in per uh, unit of cargo, and we went with the cleanest fuel possible with LNG. So those three things all compounded uh, to the uh, benefits you see here in terms of emission. There's basically no SOX or PM in, in natural gas, so all of that is coming from the pilot fuel that's burned along with the natural gas in our dual fuel engines. And then the CO2 reductions, you see a tremendous benefit here. That is all three of those effects together. If we just switched fuels, it would only be a 25 to 30 percent improvement in the CO2 profile of switching to, uh, to natural gas from diesel. That's still a huge deal. Uh, on the excellent presentation before, polishing the propeller, all those other things, almost all the owners are doing those already. So this is, what's a big chunk that can come next? Fuel switching is that next big chunk. So our program is uh, very encompassing. Uh, we've got the new build Marlin class. We've got uh, re-engineering of the Orca class, which are the ones that go to Alaska. Uh, Long-term LNG fuel procurement uh, with partners. We're not going out and producing this fuel ourselves or transporting it, uh, but we are having to sign long-term contracts. Uh, development of uh, liquefaction plants. I think that's probably the most politically sensitive of our entire program and the only spot that's met any resistance. Uh, and then LNG transfers to vessels. We're doing uh, truck to ship right now. We did one yesterday. We'll do another one on Friday in Jacksonville. So we're doing 50 trucks a week. Uh, we'll be replacing that process with a barge. It'll be the first LNG uh, barge uh, in the country. It's being built in Conrad Shipyard in Orange, Texas right now. It'll be done later this year. And then in Tacoma, we're setting up to have a direct pipeline from the liquefaction plant to our ships. So as efficient and as close by and as cold uh, as we possibly can get. So uh, highlighting the furthest along portion of our program is the Marlin class of container ships. Uh, the Isla Bea has been uh, operational since October of 2015, running primarily on natural gas. Uh, sister ship Perla del Carib uh, was out a few months later. Uh, they were built by NASCO Shipyard in San Diego. Uh, one of the few large commercial yards in the country. And uh, we are the first user of a company called MAN's uh, MEGI engine. So it's a large, slow-speed engine, uh, very high efficiency that runs on natural gas. And then we also power our auxiliaries that produce power for uh, the ship services and the refrigerated cargo uh, with dual fuel diesel generators that burn uh, natural gas primarily with a small amount of diesel. So uh, the big lessons that we learned in this program, I think, apply not just to Marine, but anywhere where you have a complex system, you're trying to make a change, there's certain uncertainties as far as the technology, and you've got a lot of players that you have to bring along. So uh, we, ha we are in a very good position with our customers and owners highly interested in the environmental impact that we were making. That was very important to them. Our, our customers, uh, being big box stores, being freight forwarders, were all trying to find ways to clean up their supply chain, to get better visibility in their supply chain. And we came to them with a tailor-made solution that had a tremendous ability to simplify, uh, simplify that equation for them and took a lot of that effort off of their plate. Uh, our owners have a multi-generational focus. They want not only to pass the company on to their, their children and grandchildren, they want to pr 
provide a better environment, a better community uh, for those next generations as well. When there's ship owners that are uh, backed by private equity that have a one or two year timeline, a project like this doesn't make sense. They're never gonna get the payback. They're never gonna have the assured ability to flip that into some uh, quick amount of profit. So they're gonna be the followers. They're gonna be the ones that are gonna move later and later once it becomes the standard, but it's gonna take companies like ours with a very long time horizon uh, and a wide perspective on the environment to drive this. Uh, the vessel technology is, is ready. It's not 100%, uh, it's not all figured out, but it's ready for prime time and ready for commercial scale. Um, and having set deployments, the, the logistics chain of any alternative fuel is a huge issue. Just like electrification and charging stations, we go, come back to the same ports over and over again. There's ships that don't know where they're gonna go from one voyage to the next that are sold five times before they reach their destination to different customers. We're going back and forth and back and forth. So we can set up a alternative fuel supply chain in one location, we can use it for decades, our partners are willing to make the commitment knowing that they have our volumes to rely on, then they can go find the guy with 10 trucks. They can find the uh, refuse haulers with a 100 truck fleet that couldn't get the LNG liquefaction plant built, but because of our demand, we're the, we're the anchor tenant, uh, and Marine can do that because of the enormous power loads that we have. And then uh, partners are critical uh, to our success. When it comes to regulatory partners with the Coast Guard and our classific classification societies, uh, that relationship, managing that relationship and understanding uh, what their issues are gonna be uh, is paramount. And uh, finding the right partners on the technology side is always difficult, uh, but those, those choices really set the path, whether you're gonna be on a path to success or a path to something just languishing and, and staying on the drawing board. So, thanks. Thanks, Ben. And I hope you're all seeing the solutions to freight um, repowering coming together here. It's not enough that we have the fantastic solutions uh, measures from companies like PACCAR, but you have to get companies to actually use them. And the uh, TOTE as a great example of a company that's willing to t both take a risk and look to the future, and not just that, but talk to their customers, talk to the big box stores, and say, we have a common approach to this solution, and get everybody on board to use the solutions. Uh, helps accelerate all of these technologies out into the world. But to wrap this up and to talk about the third component of the solution going to net zero, going to the full decarbonization, Dan Evans is the president of Promus Energy uh, based in Seattle. He has many, many years of experience in natural gas and methane project development. He's going to tell us about a fantastic uh, project that's just come to fruition in Yakima. Um, but to complete, uh, if that's not enough of a Washington connection, Dan served uh, on for delegates in Washington, D.C. for many years from uh, the Washington Congressional Delegation, and his son is a graduate of Huxley College. Nice to be home. <laughs> um, and I, I realize that I'm uh, standing between you and break, uh, and I'll try to wrap this up in 10 minutes or less, so we've got a few minutes um, left anyway at the end. Oh, for, yeah, we'll for have questions. time for questions. Okay, well, um, First of all, uh, hats off to the previous presenters, uh, PACAR and TOTE. Um, they're, they've been leading the way and uh, helped to provide the equipment uh, that, or the fuel f uh, that, that we provide. Um, but I, I'm here to present um, a little bit of information about an ultra-low carbon fuel called renewable natural gas. And we are potential fuel for both trucks and ships uh, in the form of either compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas, uh, but from a biological source. And I'd like to uh, hit on just three points. Um, one is to provide just a little bit of background on renewable natural gas and how it fits into the fuel uh, structure and um, pathways. Um, also talk about our dairy digester model and then some of the challenges and the opportunities that, that come along with that. Uh, just a, a bit about our, our company. Uh, we're a fairly new company and a small one. We were founded in 2010. Uh, both my partner and I have uh, some background in 
natural gas and actually LNG, um, Ben. So uh, you're, you're talking about the challenges of liquefied natural gas is, uh, uh, is helpful. Um, and, uh, but our, 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 our model, our business was set up uh, around the opportunity to convert waste materials, so not food products, but waste materials into renewable value-added products. And our principal product is renewable natural gas. And uh, again, it's, a, it's an ultra low carbon fuel. Um, first um, oops, sli slide is, um, it shows a little bit about the sources of renewable natural gas. So RNG is, is natural gas, chemically the same as the gas that's in the pipeline. In fact, we're what we're called a drop-in fuel. So we fit into the natural gas uh, system and uh, go right into the pipelines, have to meet uh, specifications to do that. Uh, but the sources of RNG are principally landfills. Uh, so that's, that's the big kahuna. Uh, wastewater treatment plants, uh, dairies, and other anaerobic digester um, operations uh, in the agricultural arena. And then municipal solid waste is a, is a fourth source. Um, all totaled, um, this is one of those silver buckshot uh, pellets that was referred to earlier. It's not a silver bullet, uh, but it can provide a significant portion of the transportation fuel and can convert a fleet from high carbon to low carbon if it happens uh, to be able to use uh, compressed natural gas or LNG. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of that, that scale and, and the buckshot versus the silver bullet, um, uh, there's about a billion uh, diesel gallon equivalents uh, burned every year in Washington state. Um, and if you look at the combined sources of uh, renewable natural gas, uh, we can provide very conservatively, by the way, with current technology, about 150 million diesel gallon equivalents of fuel. So that's you know, slightly less than 20% of the total fuel. But if you look at the opportunities to convert some fleets into this and to expand uh, the sources uh, for production, uh, it could become a significant part of, of our fuel inventory. So where does our model fit in? So our, our project model is based on principally manure. So we're going to take a, a dive into that arena um, uh, for, for just a moment. We can also use the other organic uh, non-manure uh, products uh, like apple waste. So treetop, for example, that produces a lot of the uh, apple and pear and other fruit products uh, in Washington State is uh, one of our providers of um, feedstock. And we have multiple um, uh, renewable uh, components that are coming out of the anaerobic digester. And by the way, an anaerobic digester is a fancy way for saying basically a, a big cow's stomach. It operates on a slower um, uh, time frame, but in about 20 to 22 days, uh, we feed manure through our mesophilic digesters goes through that and, and basically we're extracting the carbon. Most of the other materials uh, flow through and we convert some of the nitrogen and other things into different forms, but it's basically removing uh, carbon from, uh, from the manure and the other organic materials. And the products we get off it are, again, principally renewable natural gas. That's about 85% of our revenue and we'll show you where that revenue comes from in a moment. Um, but that's the major product. We clean that. Uh, biogas to pipeline quality, uh, and then uh, we received a grant from Yakima County. Uh, we happen to be in an area where there are a lot of cows, and uh, it's, um, it's a place where with, with the infrastructure, the pipeline going from our project to a major uh, pipeline um, uh, system, we are then into interstate transportation. And uh, so that's our, that's our principal product. We also pull off of that digestator, that stream. Uh, we, we can pull off a fiber product that's a peat moss substitute. It's a good revenue generator for us, nothing like renewable natural gas, uh, but it's a component. We also get um, a concentrated biofertilizer we call nutrient-rich solids. So we're cleaning that effluent that comes out of the digester and, uh, and concentrating that into a biofertilizer that we're looking to get organically certified and again achieve another revenue source and high, high value. Uh, this will give you a, a little bit of a sense of where different fuels, uh, the carbon intensity of different fuels uh, fit in. So if you look at gasoline there on, on the top, that gives us a, a reference point. 
Uh, that's about a 97, a carbon intensity, or CI of 97 um, for most gasoline or, or diesel. Um, we also then have different types of renewable fuels that fit in. The piece I'd like you to look at, though, is, is that green bar there. That's the range, the CI range, for renewable natural gas. You'll notice it's a particularly wide range. And um, we have at the sort of at the right end of that, at the higher carbon intensity levels, uh, landfill gas and some other ways of producing renewable natural gas. Where we get into negative territory, and I mean, this seems like magic, but how do you have a, a, a greenhouse gas negative or carbon negative fuel? It's because we're preventing the off-gassing of methane from dairy, di or dairy uh, lagoons. So that's a very powerful source of greenhouse gases. We're capturing that and preventing that off-gassing. So we've got a, uh, a very powerful a GHG reduction uh, capability. So we're actually a greenhouse negative fuel. Um, we've had our, our fuel uh, evaluated for its uh, CI and we're, depending on how much of the non-manure substrate we put in, we're between minus 300 and minus 150. So again, it's a very powerful way to greatly reduce carbon intensity. Um, again, some of the revenue drivers from our model um, Principally, the renewable natural gas. About 85% of our revenue comes not from the commodity value of the gas, but from the credits. There are two credits that are very powerful. Um, one is the federal credit. It's called a RIN, a renewable information number. We're in an elite category called the D3 or cellulosic RIN. A few people will nod their heads knowingly, and most of you will go, that's, that's way in the weeds. But uh, basically, it's, it, it gives us a lot of value uh, for our low carbon fuel. So that's at the federal level. So that operates anywhere in the country. And by the way, Ben, Ben's ships operating within the 200 mile limit would qualify for that RIN if they burned a portion of their fuel as renewable natural gas as opposed to geologically sourced uh, gas. Um, the other credit that we get that's even more powerful than the federal credit is the California low carbon fuels credit. Uh, it's a very, very valuable thing for someone who's got an ultra-low carbon intensity. So we get about five times the value from that credit that landfill gas would get, for example. Uh, so that's a, that's a big part of our, of our revenue package. Um, but notice they're both sort of government-oriented um, or, or based programs, and that makes it very difficult for banks or other lenders, financing entities, to support a project like ours. So that's, it's, we've been four or five years developing this project. The biggest part of that has been around the financing. Even though there's a huge upside, you know, what happens if those credits go away? Uh, last year, California re-upped its, um, its low carbon fuels program to 2030, and they uh, called for a 40% reduction in, um, in greenhouse gases uh, compared to 2009. So now the California credit is there for the long term it's operating at a fairly high net level now, and there will be some supply that's going to come in with that high value, but it's probably going to remain a, a pretty constant uh, source of, of value. We'll see what happens to the federal credits with this new administration, uh, but even they have said in the past that they're not going to, going to mess uh, with that. Um, dairies are our principal source, and I just point out two clusters. Our project cluster is down in the uh, central south uh, portion of Washington State. Happens to be right on a pipeline. Uh, there's also a cluster up here in Whatcom County. Uh, that's uh, the second cluster. We've got about 260,000 cows in Washington State, 100,000 cows in Yakima Valley. Uh, we also have to build close to the pipeline to be efficient and to put our fuel into the pipeline so it can be transported to places like California or Oregon where they have an LCFS credit. Uh, we don't have one in in this state yet, the governor made a valiant effort about two years ago. Ross and others, Eileen, were involved in, in that. And we had the senator, uh, the home senator here, Doug Erickson, was one of the principal opponents of that. And he's looking at a federal job now, so maybe there will be an opening. We'll see. Um, uh, and just a, a picture of our, or a map of our, of our dairies. We've got three of the largest dairies participating with us. And again, we help them with their nutrient management by extracting and concentrating those nutrients. So there's a, another environmental benefit um, there uh, for them. Um, the project involves uh, 13,000 cows, uh, about 
a little more than 10% of our feedstock is non-manure uh, materials like apple pumice from treetop. Um, and uh, we were using an existing digester that was used to produce electricity and is now going to produce renewable natural gas. We've got a three digester um, system feeding into a centralized gas cleaning unit that will produce uh, about 9,000 diesel gallon equivalents of fuel a day, um, as well as the biofertilizers in that fiber product. And there are other co-products like CO2 that we could use um, if the markets are right. Capital cost, by the way, is about $29 million for this project. It will generate a lot of money if, the, if those credits remain in place, uh, but that's the $64,000 question. So the policy um, issues and some of the, the issues and opportunities for us are, you know, there's, there's a lot of value and a lot of money to be made potentially in this arena, but it's, this is, these are young markets, uh, these credit markets especially. California is now uh, maturing and we've got about 10, 12 years of certainty there. Federal program has some, um, some a couple of years behind it and um, there's, uh, for any of the venture capitalists in, in the room here, there's a, there's a great opportunity to figure out a niche here on how to provide a floor for some of these credits, make a bet that they're going to be around and to take some of the upside. That's an opportunity. Uh, natural gas vehicles. Um, so PACAR and others are building uh, natural gas powered vehicles. There's not a huge market for them now. It's mostly return to base fleets because we don't have the fueling infrastructure. Uh, Marine is moving um, perhaps into the LNG space and so there's an opportunity there. But with the credits, there's an opportunity actually to provide almost free fuel to, or maybe even free fuel to the off taker uh, and have a very uh, low carbon uh, fleet. Um, pipeline access is an issue and there's some um, things that we can do about that uh, that we won't go into now, but I'll stop in favor of a couple of questions. questions. Um, thank you very much. So we'll uh, have a few questions and I'll also volunteer the panel to hang around a little bit into the break if you want to talk about trains, IMO, anything else that we didn't try to touch on. But I think you know, we pretty much solved freight, right? And we've got the solution all laid out here. You know, we at least felt all the different parts of the elephant. So you know, I think the real solution comes from everybody in this room and everybody in Washington. We've seen some great Washington companies who are really leading the way here, led by a state that is remarkably progressive on these issues, but could do even more. And a lot of you probably know how close the legislator is in this state. It's just a few more representatives and you have, you can have all of these things you want, all of these um, policies, the regulations that have helped companies like this grow and these uh, initiatives prosper. So I would challenge each of you to go out this summer, find a county that you've never been to, go to the Lynn Combine Derby, go to the Ritzville Blues Fest, go eat oysters out in Pacific County, go talk to people, go break up this tribal epistemology, <laughs> share these ideas, and get the Washington um, even closer to Jay Inslee's vision of what it could be. Um, but I want to segue from that comment to uh, this idea of regulation and policy. I think each of the industries that you're involved in have benefited greatly from, um, you, you know, we were just talking, you are just talking about renewable credits and fuel efficiency standards, and uh, there's been a lot of support for, and maybe not enough, but substantial support for LNG, uh, nationally, internationally. What's on your wish list? What would the ideal uh, regulation or policy be next? Or maybe conversely, what would you like to get rid of that's really holding up progress in your areas? And I'll ask that to all the panel. Yeah, I mean, I can go first. I, mean, I think uh, with the greenhouse gas, we have, a, we have a regulation that is very well aligned with what the, what the end customer wants, a better fuel economy. Um, so, so I think that's, uh, that, that's not ne always the case. Um, I don't think a lot of people think about what after treatment they have on their cars or their trucks. You take it for granted uh, that that it that it works and it does its thing, uh, and and that's the way we want it. You you shouldn't have to worry about the complexity that you have a small f chemistry factory uh, in the exhaust, but 
but I think with the greenhouse gas, the, the, the interests of the, the policymakers and the customers are well aligned. Um, I think in, as it pertains to uh, additional emissions regulation, I would, uh, w I mean, we would um, uh, take, take a holistic approach that you, you, we look at all the sources that, and get to the science of uh, what, it, what, is the, what are the main contributors to NOx and to smog, and we consider all sources of that and don't uh, specifically focus on any any single one industry, but that we, we need to take a science-based approach and look at the, uh, take a holistic view. Oh, well, this is easy, and I referred to it earlier. Um, I think having a low carbon fuels credit in Washington state would be a very powerful thing. Uh, the governor um, was, hey Jessica, and one of the leaders in this, this effort, by the way, kind of our, our scout leader uh, in, in this effort a couple of years ago. but. Uh, the governor um, launched an, an effort a while ago and was, is part of the Pacific Coast Collaborative. That's California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, uh, all working together and to align carbon reduction policies. Uh, it's a very powerful um, thing potentially. You know, what can we do at a smaller than national level? It's to galvanize in an area like this, uh, the fifth largest economy in the world, if you take them together. Um, so that's a very powerful economic entity to drive change and uh, having, we're, we're sort of the missing piece of the puzzle right now and figuring out how we get that low carbon fuel standard credit um, in place because right now all of our fuel is going to California because of that powerful economic incentive. You know, Oregon has just passed and adopted an LCFS program that's starting to build up to that level. And uh, if we could do the same thing, it would be a very powerful thing for renewable fuels in Washington State. Yes. Uh, I think there, there's probably a, a number of things on the on the wish list. I know uh, uh, ports in Northern Europe, uh, Hamburg, Antwerp, are uh, uh, discounting the port fees for users of LNG, and that's something that hasn't been seen in the U.S. Uh, I think we do get great regulatory support from, from the U.S. Coast Guard, but I don't think there's enough understanding outside of that organization uh, with other regulatory bodies of, uh, of the practical impacts of their regulations or, or uh, generally applicability to the maritime side. Uh, but I think I'd take it kind of a different way of, uh, you know, I'd like to see more of a pull from our customers, and that means more of a pull from everybody here and, and, and consumers uh, writ large for asking companies, what's in your supply chain? What are you doing to improve uh, the, the carbon intensity or the, uh, the NOx uh, profile of your supply chain? And that goes to, uh, you know, they're operating in your community, they're employing people in your community, but there's also a social responsibility that if nobody's asking them, they're not gonna look into it. And so that comes, you know, either from the investor side or the consumer side, but regardless of an administration, it's there, and that's a big pull. Uh, if you can't get the push on one side, you can pull from the other. Nice, yeah, excellent ideas. I, one of the things that we talked about earlier, oh, are you done? Okay. Yeah, I think I got to <laughs> off. We could keep going all day, but please come chat with us at the break if you'd like to learn a little bit more. We'll be here for a little bit. Thanks, Galen. I want to thank the panel and apologize for coming I also want to uh, award Carl the award for the uh, coolest video uh, <laughs> visuals and, and thank PACAR again for being one of the sponsors of the event Absolutely. and for, uh, for all your uh, colleagueship and collaboration. And so we'll have a break for about 10 minutes. Uh, and we have planes, trains, automobiles, so we have personal, mil personal mobility uh, coming up in the next panel and then policy. And so we'll, we'll return to the policy issues uh, once one more time.